Sometimes it's easier to combine two functions into one. That's called a composite function. We're going to look at why you would do this and when you would do this in this video. What's up, y'all? I'm Tom. This is Like a Math Class. Let's get to composite functions. So let's say that you found an entry-level pharmaceutical sales job that offers you $2,500 per month plus 7% sales commission on everything you sell above $20,000. A commission is sometimes given when you are selling things and it's a percentage of the amount that you sell. So sometimes you get a base salary, so every month, no matter how much you sell, you get that salary. And then if you sell a lot, then you get an extra bonus on top of that. That's what a commission is. You sold 50500 worth of pharmaceuticals this month. How much salary did you earn in this month? And we're going to be looking at the commission on monthly sales, and then we're going to look at our total earnings for the month. That's how we'll determine how much our overall salary that we had this month is. Let's call our pharmaceutical sales that we sell each month, let's call that P. So our commission based on the sales that we make is going to be equal to 0.07, that's this 7%, times P minus 20,000, right? Because if, if we sell everything above 20,000, we have to take that P, the pharmaceutical sales that we have in that month, and we have to subtract our 20,000 and then put that 7% on there. So our monthly sales, our monthly sales, right? Our monthly sales, all of these things are represented by the amount that we sell in that month. And once we put that into the equation, we're going to get our commission for that month, our commission for that month. So if we wanted to find out what our total earnings for the month were, the total earnings that we're going to have are going to be based on the, the commission that we get. And we're going to take that commission and we're going to add our monthly amount of 2500 That's this piece right here, 2500 per month. So if we can figure out what our commission is, which is this whole thing right here, if we can figure that out, we can put that into our equation and then we can find out what our total earnings for the entire month is. So we've got C of our pharmaceutical sales for the month is 50,500. That's gonna be 0 0.07 times 50,500 minus 20,000 which is going to be 0 0.07 times 30,500, which is going to give us a value of $2,135. So now if I've got my earnings based on my commissions, I'm going to take $2,135 because I, again, I'm just taking this and I'm putting it up into this equation here. Now I've got $2,135 plus $2,500 and my total earnings for that month is going to be $4,635. So all I did was I took the result from this equation and I put it into this equation. So this thing here, this piece, so this thing here is based on this. It's based on our monthly sales. So we cannot find out our total earnings without first finding this commission. So what we're finding is we have to calculate one piece and then we have to take the result of that piece and put it into the next equation. But wouldn't it be nice if we could just do it all in one shot? That's where composite functions come in. So instead I could say my earnings are going to be based on whatever I've calculated for my commission, which is this whole piece right here. So I could take 0 0.07 times P minus 20,000. And if I did that, then that would mean if I'm following this same equation over here, I would put all of this in for my C value here, which means I'm going to have 0 0.07 times P minus 20,000 and then I'm going to add $2,500 for that. And if we see what we're doing here, we've actually created this earnings based on not only our commissions, but if we really look at it, the only input we have now is going to be the pharmaceutical sales. So what we've done is we've recreated an equation in terms of E of P, in terms of 
uh, the earnings in terms of our pharmaceutical sales. So I've got 0 0.07 times P minus 20,000 plus 2,500. So this P, this P, it's the only variable remaining when I substitute one equation into another. So what I've done is I've taken this earnings based on commission and I've now created an earnings equation or an earnings function based on pharmaceutical sales. So I've just created one big equation instead. That's a composite function. So composite functions are just taking one equation and putting it into another equation to simplify your overall process. Now there's a few ways that we write this. One way that we write this is F O G and you'll notice this is an open circle and we say this or we read this as F of G. So when you see this open circle here, F of G or F of G of X or F of G of X or F of G uh, of X. These are all four different ways that you'll see this written. Now this one is not used as frequently, but you will see it occasionally show up on, on exams. I tend to stick with this whenever possible. I use this notation because this tells me, hey, I'm actually putting one equation inside another equation. So this one helps me recognize which one's going on the inside and which one's staying on the outside. What's commonly written on exams, the ones that I tend to see most frequently on exams, are these right here where we say f of g of x or f of g. So what I always do is if I see it one of these two ways or like this, I personally rewrite it this way. And what this means is that g is going into f. So notice up here, here we put the commission function inside the earnings one. So while we have this e of c, the one inside here is all of this. So if we know that these are all different ways to say that, here we can see this function went inside that one. So here the, the G is going inside F. The G is going inside of F. The G is going to go inside of F. The G is already inside F. So when you're creating a composite function, you need to remember that the second piece goes inside of the first piece, or as we've stated here, the second piece is already inside that first function. And if I wanted to write this as we did with our, e, our earnings and our commission, this would be uh, E of C, or we could say uh, E of C of P, because we were talking about pharmaceutical sales. This was our pharmaceutical sales. This was our commission. Here is our earnings, right? We could do it that way. Or we could do E of C of P. So here's our pharmaceutical sales. Here's our commission calculation. And that whole thing is going to give us our earning. Or you can say the same thing here where we've got E of C with P implies some result. Okay, that's a lot to kind of wrap your head around. Hopefully I'm not making it too complex for you, but I really want to drive home this idea of the second one goes inside the first one. So I've got two examples for us. One's going to be pretty straightforward and then one gets a little bit trickier. So let's take a look at those. So here we've got two functions. F of X is X minus one and G of X is X squared. So we want to find these three composite functions. So again, I'm going to rewrite this in the way that I'm more comfortable with. I'm going to write it as F of G of X. So I know that G of X is going inside of F of X. So here, this is actually X squared. And so, and, and then our function F is actually X minus one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put x squared into x minus 1. So this is going to be x squared minus 1. What I've done is I've replaced every single x with g of x. g of x is x squared. So I'm replacing this x with x squared, which is why I come up with x squared minus 1. So I could say f of g of x is x squared minus 1. Now, what about this one here? Now we're saying f is going inside of g. All right, so now I'm going to have g of f 
of x. All right, so now this is x minus 1, where g is x squared. So now I'm going to be putting x minus 1 in everywhere I see x. I'm going to put x minus 1 in everywhere I see x. So this is going to be x minus 1 squared because this thing went inside of this thing. This thing went inside of this thing. So g of f of x is equal to x minus 1 squared. And then the last one, this one's kind of weird because it's saying put f inside of f. So here we're just going to put f of f of x. Now, this might not be something that you do in uh, a contextual situation, but it might be something that shows up on a test so it shows that you know what you're talking about when you're doing composite functions. So that's saying take x minus 1 and input it into every single time you see x in this x minus 1 function. So that's going to be this x minus 1 is going to go into this x. So I'm going to have x minus 1 minus 1. So I'm ultimately going to come up with x minus 2. So f of f of x is equal to x minus 2. Like I said, these were fairly straightforward problems. It's just taking one equation, popping it into another. If you found this helpful so far, give me a thumbs up, like the video, and let's get on to our next example, which is a little bit more tricky. Here we've got two functions, f of x, which is the square root of x minus 1, and g of x, which is x squared plus 5. So find g of f of x. So for part A, g of f of x. Okay, so that means I've got to put f of x inside of g. So I've got to put f of x inside of g. So let's, let's actually do that substitution. g of square root of x minus 1. Here's another way that you can look at it. So now I'm going to take g of x x minus 1. So everywhere I see that x, I'm going to replace it with uh, square root of x minus 1. So it's going to be equal to square root of x minus 1 squared plus 5. So now I can simplify this a little bit. So now I can simplify this a little bit further. A square root squared just leaves me with that inside piece. So I'm going to have x minus 1 plus 5, which leaves me with x plus 5. Four. Then B says, state the domain and range for this. All right, so x plus 4. So if I look at x plus 4, well, the domain of this thing is going to be all real numbers, right? It's a linear equation. It's going to keep on going up. Straightforward, right? Not straightforward. This is why I said this one gets a little bit trickier. The domain of this is not all real numbers because... In order for us to get to this, we had to go through this function. This is like a restriction on the domain of this end result. We know for a square root function that we can't have a negative inside there. If I take anything smaller than 1, I'm going to end up with a negative number. So in this case, the domain is going to be every x value bigger than or equal to 1. If I put 0 in for x, if I, put, if I put 0 in here, I'm going to get a positive 4. But if we go back to the very beginning and I put 0 into that square root function, I'm going to have 0 minus 1. That's going to be negative 1. Square root of negative 1 can't do that. So we've got to have that restriction. So when you're looking at composite functions, make sure you go back to the inner function to determine what your domain might be because there might be some restrictions on there. And then our range, let's look at this in two slightly different ways. If I put uh, 1 into here, I'd have 1 plus 4, which is going to be 5. So I'm going to have everything bigger than 5. So in this case, y should be greater than or equal to 5. The other way to consider this, what if I put 1 into my original function? Okay, well that's going to be square root of 1 minus 1, which is square root of 0, which is 0. So if I did that, then this here, this would be, this would be g of 0. Because right, this is the output, right? I Because I'd have to do this piece first. So 
the output of this is now the input of G. And if I put zero into G, then that means I'm going to have G of zero squared plus five, which is five. And these two things line up, which is why my range is greater than or equal to five. So what did we just see? We actually saw two things there. First, we saw we have to look at the inner function to see if there's any constraints on our domain and then find our range from those constraints. And the second thing we saw was once we have our domain, we can either straight away put those values into our end result or we start taking those values, put it into uh, our inner function, our inner function and calculate that. And then the result of that goes into our outer function. So the result of that goes into our outer function. So when you're looking at a test, if you don't remember how to do a compositor, if it gets too complicated, put it in the inner function, calculate, take that result, and then put that into the outer function, calculate, get that result. As long as you've restricted the domain properly for that inner piece, you've now have, inner piece, ah. As long as you've found the, the, uh, the value of that inner piece, that will now be the input of our outside function. So that's it for composite functions. I'll see you in the next video where we start talking about inverse functions. I'll see you there.